Hello, and welcome back to the Alexander Society, the podcast where we're just, you know, two assholes getting drunk and talking about all of the awful, horrible stuff that has happened in our past for some reason, because that's really the only way you can cope with this. Getting wildly drunk. Yeah, it. I've come to realize from all of the time that I waste just reading and learning about this stuff nonstop that like, of course, of course, drinking became a staple of the human race. Uh, it's the, it's the only way that we can deal with this kind of stuff. The, the more you learn, the more you realize that the human race is a deeply flawed idea and so much. You're not wrong. Yeah. It, but we have alcohol and that makes everything better. So uh, Tim, how have you been? been good good buddy what about you been all right i guess been looking forward to this <laughs> i have too so what are you drinking today so my shooting is still tito's for now i'll probably switch it up next episode just to keep it changed up and again i'm still sipping on these um hard sodas i found that i like two of them but the other two i don't really like they're four different flavors They've got a cherry cola, which you really only get the cherry, and it tastes nothing like the other, the classic cola, which is actually good. They've got a Sprite knockoff, which is not very good. And they got an orange soda, which is pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Those sound awful. <laughs> they do. They, they are. I literally, it, my curiosity was just like, well, I want to know how bad they are. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So tonight, um, I'm going to be switching it up a little bit. Not by choice. I just ran out of the other stuff. So all I have left is um, root beer schnapps, which is, oh goodness. Yeah, it's um, it's not awful, but it's also only twenty percent, which is very disappointing. Very much so. What is my Tito's? It's a uh, forty. Forty. Ooh, that's that's what I need. That's what I need. So I'm mixing this with a Coke that I got from ta- uh, from Burger King, and I'll also be doing shots with it. So that's a bad idea. Yeah, I know, but it's what I've got. <laughs> you better be ready for the next episode with something better. All I gotta say. Yeah, you're right. I gotta get more of that sarsaparilla whiskey. That ooh, that stuff. Is, hmm, I could live on that stuff. I'd, I'd probably be significantly less stressed out at everything. I know. They, the boys keep on telling me how good it is, and I've only tried it the once I think you brought it. Yeah. So, let's go over the rules one more time for our audience. So, rule number one. We take a shot at the start of the episode, so let's go ahead and do that. <sighs> mm. Woo! I put a little bit more than a shot this time on accident. Ah, uh, well. It's kind of hard to get that gauge right when you ain't got a shot glass and you're just pouring it into your cup. I'm going to do a second shot because that's not nearly enough alcohol. I'm not even going to bother with the shot. I'm just going to sip from the bottle because... <laughs> okay, there we go. That works. All right, what's rule number two? Rule number two, if there's an event where someone dies, we take a sip from our drink. And that's how we cope. Yes, we sip it away. Rule number three. If we mention a character in the course of our episode who was in a previous episode, we take a sip. It, rule number four. If alcohol is mentioned some in some form or fashion, we take a sip. We take a sip because that's how we cope. Now, rule number five. If something happens in the script where somebody dies and alcohol is involved, we take a shot. And again, that's how we cope. That's how we cope. <laughs> I don't know if I gave the spoiler in the last episode, but we will be doing that before we're done talking about Alexander. So, all right. So when we left off in the last episode, Alexander had successfully suppressed the rebelling Greek city-states. And in order to shore up his frontier around Macedon, he had started he had started a campaign into Thrace. And he had just defeated a Thracian tribe at the Shikpa Pass through the Hamas Mountains. 1,500 were left dead. Okay. So, following that, he continued moving up north. He encountered another tribe, which a name is actually given in the historical documents. They're called the Tribalians. He was starting, he was, he was making some good headway. He was about three days from the Danube, Danube River at this point. And, um, but he was being stopped up by 
a large force of Tribalian warriors um, who were kind of held up in a wooded glen and were surrounded by like rocky outcroppings around the mountain. It was like a hilly mountainous region. So basically like it was like a wooded area. They were set up in like a clearing. So uh, Alexander ran into this problem where he couldn't he couldn't outflank them and he couldn't move them. He couldn't move his uh, phalanx through the trees because they'd break up his force. And if he risked that, he might be overrun. So what he did instead was he hid his cavalry and his phalanx in the woods surrounding the glen and he sent his archers forward. So these archers, they started firing into this into this clearing, into this glen. And the Tribalians were like, okay, that's an easy target. So they started coming out of the glen into the wooded area and trying to chase down these archers. These archers immediately fell back and were completely sur- the Tribalians were completely surrounded on all sides by Alexander's troops. Dang. Yeah, before the day was over, uh, 3,000 Tribalians were dead. Only about 50 Macedonians were dead. Damn. Yeah, it, you're going to get some really outlandish ratios like that a lot. Like, I, th- I think I mentioned this in the last episode, even the most conservative estimate of casualties at some of these battles is just absolutely ridiculous. You get like like a like hundred to one casualty rate between Alexander's forces and whoever he happens to be fighting. He was obviously very successful to go along as long as he did, but with the ratios being so skewed, uh, how likely is that that was just his propaganda or how likely is it that that's actually how it went down? See, that's the thing is that his propaganda really inflated enemy casualty numbers and really deflated his own casualty numbers. But even if you ca- account for a really wide margin of error, it's still like amazingly lopsided. Even if in a in a given battle you magnify Alexander's casualties by like a factor of 10, you still get situations where he's lost like 500 troops to like 10,000 enemy troops wow um and a big part of that is because that it was actually pretty common during ancient battles whichever whichever side broke first um the other side would try to chase them down as they were running away and that's when most of the casualties would end up happening damn so a lot of those casualties didn't happen during the actual fighting it happened when the retreat was occurring yeah during the retreat um there's going to be another battle coming up later you're going to see that really well and it's oh 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 it's it's brutal it's depressing killing retreating troops always kind of is but i guess that's a modern perspective kind of thing yeah back then it was just smart strategy because if you let them all just run away with their lives they were going to just reform their army and because relative to how many you killed during the retreat the number that actually died in the fighting was kind of low. Um, they would always, if you just let them escape, they could easily reform their forces back up into a coherent army and just immediately attack you again. So it was better to make sure you got as many as you could while you had them. I guess historically it makes sense. Yeah. I think the, the real lesson from that is that war just sucks. Yeah. War is, war is just awful. So three days after this, uh, he Alexander and his army reached the Danube. Um, they rendezvous with that fleet that he had sent out from Byzantium. Um, and here they encounter a problem. So the that those that tribe that he had just fought, the Tribalians, he had to. Um, they were one of the strongest tribes in the region, and he knew he would have to subjugate them if he was able to keep his northern frontier secure. The problem was. The remaining Tribalians had set up uh, powerful defenses on an island that was in the middle of the Danube River. And this island was surrounded by rapids that ran too quickly and too deep for his army to get across quickly. So they could get rafts and stuff, but they... But it was such rough water that they wouldn't be able to get across very quickly, and they'd be extremely disorganized when they actually got to the shore. I mean, it's smart. Yeah, so the Tribalians were in a really good defensive position, and Alexander knew it. Oh, yeah, we forgot to take a drink. Was it a sit? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, there we go. That was for the the first battle against the Tribalians. Yeah, so the Tribalians were in a really good defensive position 
Um, and looking back on it, most any other general would have just looked at that situation and said, eh, I've done enough. Time to turn back. But Alexander kind of proves at this at this point like how determined he is to never half-ass a single thing. He is determined to dislodge those this tribe no matter what the cost. So he he hatched a completely ridiculous idea. Um, and the only reason that this idea even worked was because of a stroke of dumb luck. That dumb luck was that it just so happened that on the other side of the river Danube, um, a nomadic horse tribe had set up camp within I within sight of the Tribalian encampment on that island. So he got the idea that he would find like a like a calmer area of the river for his army to cr- travel across, and he would cross over in t- onto the other side of the river. And he would launch a surprise attack against this tribe. The Gete is what they were called. And they're like like a nomadic horse, like a steppe culture. You, you know, the kind like like Mongols or Huns. They're, they're kind of the same thing. Um, and he was going to launch a surprise attack against them. And he was hoping that a grand show of force would terrify the Tribalians into surrendering. And so that's exactly what he did. He found a calm area of the river. He stole a bunch of canoes from all up and down the river. And he crossed the river in the middle of the night. And then as the sun started to rise, uh, he launched this enormous attack on this nomadic tribe. They were just waking up. And with before they even really had a chance to fight, the Gete immediately turned and ran. They ran back into the steppe and they just left. They just left the battlefield and they left behind a like a tent encampment. Like, you you know, like the. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So Alexander orders his troops to go in, loot all of the tents and then set them all on fire. Damn. The Tribalians were. Yeah, the Tribalians were watching on in horror, realizing just like just how brutal that Alexander's army would be, even though a lot of really not a lot of people died in this engagement because all the Gete ran before they even fought. But from their perspective, they just saw them engage this entire tribe who then turned tail and ran, and then they ransacked and burned their entire village. So the Tripolian, the Tribalians like it, it, the plan works basically the Tribalians, they come out of their encampment. They send a peace envoy offering their surrender and, Um, offering like tribute of like gold and all that kind of stuff to Alexander. Um, And pretty soon word got out about what had happened, that the Tribalians had been subjugated by Alexander and all of the other Thracian Thracian and Celtic tribes all up and down the Danube river immediately started sending him envoys in order to offer their subjugation. And so. Damn. He took, he took an entire area just by scaring the shit out of him, basically. Yeah. It, Alexander was an expert at convincing people to be scared of him, even in situations where he probably couldn't back it up. Along with just being like a good battlefield strategist, he was an expert in, I guess, what we would call psychological warfare. I mean, it sounds like it. He, Yeah, he knew how to leverage his... He he knew how to use an army effectively, and he also knew how to uh, utilize that army's effectiveness to scare people. So he had basically pacified all of Thrace in one fell swoop. So with that done, um, he moved west into Illyria, or what we would now call the Balkans. I'm not going to get too much into that campaign. Just just know that he kind of does a lot of the same stuff. He uses he leverages like the sheer size and ability of his army in order to scare a bunch of different tribes into um, surrendering and subjugating themselves. Now, so he he's 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 finishing up in Illyria. He's done a lot of he's done a lot of conquering, and he gets this absolutely terrifying report from Pella. Uh, he gets a report back saying that. The entirety of Greece basically has risen up in revolt against him. Oh damn! 
Yeah. And the reason is because a rumor had made it back to Athens that Alexander and his entire army had been wiped out in Thrace. And so they, they thought that the the seat of Ma- that the throne of Macedon was now vacant and that it was weak and this was their opportunity to break free. And so now Athens and Thebes were whipping up the entire uh, Hellenic peninsula into a like a rebellious frenzy. Everybody was they were kicking out their um, their Macedonian garrisons, uh, killing Macedonian officers, all all of that stuff. There was a rumor that one of um, that one of uh, Alexander's allies, Amentus, uh, that was the guy that uh, he was uh, one of the two commanders in Asia Minor that had that he had convinced to join his side when he had first come to the throne. They were part of the anti-Macedon faction at first, but then he convinced them to join him. There, He got some intelligence that this guy, Amentus, had helped spark these rebellions in order to stage a coup against Alexander. So Amentus had turned his back on his, on his word. To make matters even worse, uh, Darius, the king of Persia, was also getting in on it. And at the time that uh, Greece was rising up against Alexander. Darius launched an offensive into Asia Minor against Parmenio's forces over there. So things were looking really bad for Alexander at this point. So he, the first thing he did was he sent a letter to his mother to organize the assassination of both Amentus and his baby half brother Carinus. Carinus had been the second. Whose baby half brother? Alexander's. Oh damn, that's ruthless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carinus was the second child of um, uh, that wife, that fifth wife that Alex there that Philip had married. Yeah. Um, so she had ended up having two kids, uh, that daughter and this this kid named Carinus. And so Alexander ordered both Amentus and Carinus to be killed uh, because Amentus because he was actively trying to overthrow Alexander, and Carinus because he was a legitimate claimant to the throne. Amentus was able to escape and he went to exile and we're not really going to hear much from him again for the rest of the story. So he has no real greater role in history? No, not really. Uh, But Carinus, Olympias does end up catching Carinus. And according to some of the stories, though I, to to be clear, I kind of doubt this story actually happened. But according to one story, she killed this baby by pushing the baby's face into a kiln of burning charcoal. Holy shit. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to need a drink. Hold on. Yeah, no, like that's a good glug for me. Um uh regardless of how she actually did it, not only did she kill Carinus, but she also killed the other baby and the mother. And Alexander was infuriated by that. He had ordered Carinus to be killed because he was a legitimate claimant, but the other two being killed was just bad PR with no actual benefit. I can imagine. So the reason I kind of doubt the story about shoving the baby into burning charcoal is it because it buys into a lot of stories, or it aligns well with a lot of stories about Olympias being like a jealous temptress. Like there were stories about her by anti-Philip historians who per- portray her as like a, a witch and like a ruthless calculating monster. When really she kind of, she was definitely ruthless, but she wasn't, she never showed any examples of being necessarily like brutal. Okay. She was very shrewd. She was very calculating. She did a really good job of keeping herself in a position of power but she was never outlandishly. This is the only real story of her being outlandishly uh, violent for no reason. So how likely it is that, that she still killed the child, but she didn't do it that way? That it, She probably didn't kill the baby that way. I don't think she did. I, did she still kill the... Is it likely that she still killed the baby, though? But she, she definitely killed the baby, yes. I just don't see what what she would have gained from doing it that way because that would have been a calculation in her mind what would she have gained if she killed the baby in exactly this way okay um and there was no added benefit to it 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 would just have just been a, a like ruthless anger and hatred which really wasn't her kind of thing 
So that being done, Alexander very quickly marches his army back to Pella, informs the, make sure that word gets out that he's still alive and he still has his army and he's on his way back. And then he moves down south back into central Greece uh, and he besieges the city of Thebes. This is... This is probably one of the most brutal things that he does in his entire life is what he's about to do to Thebes. Like, on the level of brutal, how talk bad are we talking? Are we talking, like, your normal war? Are we talking World War? Are we talking Hiroshima levels? Historically, obviously, not with modern context. I don't think there's any precedent for... Because, it, I'll, I'll get to it, but it involves the entire city of Thebes becoming depopulated. Oh, yeah, so that's I don't want to say impressive, but that's a big feat for back then. Yeah, um, so Thebes was the biggest danger to Alexander because it was smack dab in the middle of the Hellenic Peninsula. It was smack dab in the middle of Greece, and so if he didn't control Thebes, then he wouldn't control Greece because he would have inevitably have to move his army through that area in order to get anywhere. So he besieges the city. He sends a demand of surrender, saying that if they submitted, they wouldn't be punished. Okay. But the Thebans knew that that wasn't true because they ha they were currently holding a bunch of, essentially holding a Macedonian garrison hostage within their city and had killed several Macedonian officers in the process. So they knew that there was, there was going to be retribution in some form, even if it was only against a few of the leadership, that leadership wasn't about to accept that. So instead, in response to that, they sent out a call to Alexander's troops directly, just completely ignoring Alexander, saying, if any of you want to fight for freedom, you should join Thebes. If you want to fight for a tyrant, fight for Alexander. And that that really pissed Alexander off. Be one, because he didn't like being told the truth. Of course. And two, because he didn't like being ignored. <laughs> so this it was very personal to him. And he obviously he's going to be very frustrated because he needs he needs Greece subjugated in order to go over to Asia and meet his destiny. And so Alexander now being angry, he orders his siege towers forward and he storms the wall. He almost immediately drives back the Theban garrison there. His troops storm over the walls. And first, it, it doesn't happen immediately. So first they, first they occupy the city and then... Alexander goes to the uh, the Hellenic League, the government of the Hellenic League, okay. and asks them what he should do with what he should do with Thebes. And because remember, the Athenian League is just a puppet government that Alexander is using to control. Uh, but he, but it's necessary to get their approval to do stuff like what he's about to do, so that he can push some of the responsibility off of himself. And kind of say, this isn't an act of a brutal conqueror. This is calculated by a bunch of people, basically. Yeah, this is an act of uh, democratic mandate, basically, is his, how he's trying to portray it. But of course, they're all puppet leaders, and a lot of them have a bone to pick with Thebes. They all, a lot of them have like a historic rivalry with Thebes. So a lot of these delegates, like just I mean, they all just rubber stamp uh, and say, yeah, burn the city to the ground. And whoever survives, sell them all into slavery. So that's exactly what he does. Jesus. He orders his troops in. They set fire to every single building. They start killing indiscriminately. And anybody that they don't kill, they capture and they send into slavery. Jesus. Keep in mind, Thebes is one of the most ancient and culturally important cities in all of Greece. Um the psychological effect that this had on the Greek people was immense because nothing like this had ever happened in Greek history, at least in recorded history. Uh, Thebes was the was purported to be the ancient birthplace of a lot of the heroes from her Homeric legend, like the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, Achilles was from Thebes. And so this sent a very, very important message to the Greek world. Yeah. If you don't take the carrot, then you get the stick. I mean, that's one massive stick. Yeah, um, I'm drinking. Hold on. There, there's no way you couldn't drink to that. That, 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 
in a somber way, I guess you could say. Yeah. Now, Alexander's going to do a lot of horrible stuff in Asia. There's only one other instance in his entire career that even comes close to as bad as what he did to the city of Thebes. But we'll get to that. He had something that came cl- even close? He had something that I ar- I would argue was probably worse. Oh, good God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Probably not, not in this episode, but we'll get to it. <laughs> So yeah, that the sacking of Thebes uh, pretty much brought Greece into line. He presumed permanently, although it's never gonna it's never actually gonna be permanent. But for the time being, Greece was pacified enough that we finally get to the big moment. We finally get to the point where Alexander crosses the Dardanelles and invades the Persian Empire. Okay. So he sets off in the spring of 334 BC. Uh, He crosses the Dardanelles at a place called Elaeum. He chose Elaeum because it was reported to be the final resting place of the very first soldier to jump off of the Greek, uh, to land in Asia, the very first Greek soldier to land in Asia during the Trojan War. And from like the Iliad. And that was, that was really important to Alexander. He was trying to represent himself as like a Homeric uh, hero, like Achilles. Every kid wants to be their hero. This is just one messed up version of it. Yeah. Well, this is a kid wanting to be a, be his hero, but he actually has the money and the power to try and see it through. And that that's, that's really the problem here is that if, if Alexander had been born into any other social class in any other point in time, he just would have been a kid with dreams. None of this would have happened. <laughs> but because he happened to have the ideas that he had, and he was born into a time and place where he had the ability and the resources to do what he did, probably millions of people died. <laughs> and the world was changed irrecably. Irre- what's the word? Irrevocably. Irrevocably, yeah, thank you. (laughs) But the world was changed irrevocably forever. The story goes that as his ship approached the shore on the other side of the Dardanelles, uh, he was standing at the bow of the ship in full armor and threw a spear in the sand before jumping off. And that was supposed to represent he had come to conquer Asia by the sword and by the spear. And just as a spoiler... From this point forward, he would never set foot in Greece again. Oh, goodness. He got his gold, but at a big cost, I guess. When we get into it a little bit later, you're going to find out he didn't really have any interest in Greek Greece anymore after a certain point. Uh, he kind of left it in the rearview mirror, and it caused a bunch of problems. I can imagine. <laughs> so, one of the first stops was to the city of Ilium, which, um, again... Going back to the Iliad, Ilium was reported to be the gravesite of Achilles and Patroclus, who were both characters in the Iliad. They were best friends. And so Alexander and his friend, that guy I mentioned earlier, Hephaestion, yeah, they go to Ilium and they lay wreaths at the grave. Afterwards, they go and visit the sanctuary of Athena. They make sacrifices, all that stuff. Um, And from there, they begin conquering cities all over the Western Anatolia. Um, Regardless of whether or not they were Greek, uh, most cities realized where the winds were turning and they offered their full support to Alexander without a fight. And that that that's going to be how he ends up conquering most of Asia. He'll just move a big army into a new place and everybody will immediately surrender. I mean, can you blame him, really? It's actually well. For most of his career, it's actually relatively rare that he actually uses his army for its intended purpose. Um, yeah, so... Uh, but there were a few cities that resisted him, including even Greek cities. Uh, because a lot of Greek states actually had a really good thing going in per- with in the Persian Empire. Uh, they got protection from the Persian army, and they had a relative... They were able to say moderately independent. All they had to do was pay a few taxes to the to the king of Persia and they were fine. And so they saw Alexander as a worse situation. And so they ended up resisting and they would immediately be brought down to the siege. Wow. It usually wouldn't take too long either. Uh, Because again, they usually had the Persian army to help them. And in these situations, there was no army in sight. 
Yeah. So now the Persian king was facing essentially the full united might of the entire Greek peninsula wandering around his territories in Asia Minor. So Darius uh, calls a council of war with all of his high-ranking generals. What Probably his most effective general was this guy named Memnon. Now the weird thing is Memnon, his name was Memnon of Rhodes, and he was Greek. He was a Greek mercenary um, and easily the best commander that Darius had in his entire army. Um, so Memnon, Memnon suggested that since Alexander's army, because he had been appraised on the situation, he knew what was going on in Greece, and he knew that Alexander's big dumb army was costing him a fortune to maintain because they were all professional and they were all being paid very well. And Alexander just didn't have the money to spend on other stuff, like like enough supplies to keep them like fed and stuff. And so they were having to live off the land. They would just scour the countryside for food and things like that. And so Memnon's idea was that if they burned all of the crops in, in Asia Minor, then Alexander would have no choice but to send his army back to Greece because he wouldn't be able to feed them. Now, the Persian high command... Uh, was absolutely appalled at the idea. For one thing, in their Zoro Zoroastrian faith, it was actually a very deep sin to burn crops. Yeah. Uh, for another thing, they were too prideful to admit that they had to retreat. Uh, and for a third thing, um, Memnon was Greek. And so they they kind of had the suspicion that he was on Alexander's side, even though he, he would demonstrate very clearly that he was not. But at the time, they 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 had the suspicion that he was on secretly on Alexander's side, and he was trying to convince them to destroy their own country so that Alexander could swoop in and take it. Interesting. So instead, they decide to uh, just send in an army and face Alexander head on, which is exactly what he wanted, because Alexander knew that he had the ability to beat any army that they put in front of him. So as he moved deeper into central Anatolia in, the May, in May of 334, the Persians took up a defensible position on the banks of a river in Asia Minor called the Granicus River. Um, they set up on an elevated slope with their backs to the river and a deep stream running in front of them. So when Alexander came to face them, he realized that he'd have a hard time getting any of his forces across that stream. Uh, but he also wasn't willing to retreat either because he knew that he'd have to fight them at this moment uh, or else his... Because if he left them just to wander around the countryside, um, he'd eventually run out, of, uh, run out of room for his troops to forage and they'd start to starve to death. Uh, you're going to see that happen a lot. Um so the Persians are on the defense. They're in a really defensible position. Uh, his commanders protest. Like, they tell him, like, no, you don't have to fight this battle. It, it, it's not necessary. We can retreat and we can, we can force them to fight on better ground. But Alexander was hearing nothing, none of it. Well, as many leaders do, they're like, it's my way. I'm, I'm the great, mighty leader that knows what to do. Yes. But he also wasn't willing to fight on the Persians' terms. So he went back to his classic trick, which was moving his entire army across the stream in the middle of the night. So he successfully, I'm not really sure how he did it, but he got his entire army across that stream. And when the Persians woke up the next morning, they realized that uh, the entire Macedonian army was now facing them from their left flank. So now there was nothing but empty open field standing between Alexander and the Persian army. And now they had this law, this rap, this fast deep stream on their, on Alexander's left flank. And they had the entire river on their right flank. So there was no real feasible way that they could be completely surrounded. So they were caught off guard by the Macedonian army. Um, both sides pretty quickly formed up their lines and prepared for battle. The Persians moved their cavalry, which outnumbered Macedon's cavalry, about two to one to, to cover their entire front line, and they put all of their infantry in reserve. Dang. They did that because they knew their infantry was dog shit. 
their infantry were just a bunch of peasant farmers that had been raised and given swords. And they knew that they would never stand a chance against Alexander's phalanx. So their plan was to try and uh, stretch out their battle line so it was longer than Alexander's battle line. Because they did, they did pretty much outnumber Alexander at this point. Um, their plans were to push Alexander's flanks back and then force all of their cavalry around him so that they could envelop him from all sides. And then once he was enveloped, they'd send their infantry in and finish cutting down the Macedonian army. But Alexander uh, put that same strategy that his father had done at uh, the Battle of Chironea. He did that again. So he Alexander was set up on the right side of his lines, and the Persians, when they saw where Alexander was, they moved the bulk of their cavalry to that side of the battlefield because they intended to kill Alexander as quickly as they could. I mean, I don't blame him after what he did. Um, but th yeah, their intention was to cut off the head of the army as quickly as possible so that they could deal with it sooner rather than later. And so the bulk of this cavalry was on uh, was on the side closest to the river. They immediately uh, charge and try and get into um, Alexander's right flank. Meanwhile, Parmenio, that old old general that we mentioned earlier, he's commanding the left flank, and he's coming at the Persian lines in a slant with his left flank closest to the stream, clear and open to uh, clear and open to the Persian army. So you've got the situation where one side of the Persian army is trying to go in their direction, and the other side of the army is trying to go in the complete other direction. And so as they push forward and forward and forward, a gap opens up in, their, in the middle. Alexander sees that gap, and just like at Chironea, he, he sends all of his commanding cavalry and leads them in a charge right into the middle of that gap. So how does that play out for him? When he rushes into the gap, he immediately gets into a fight with all of the highest commanding, literally all like all of the bodyguard of all of the officers in the Persian army. Okay. So every, sing every single person who has any sort of rank or status in that army is now in a life or death battle with Alexander, like Alexander personally and his companion cavalry. According to the reports, he was actually right in the thick of it. He was fighting and cutting and stabbing with the rest of his troops, the rest of his cavalry there. Interesting. You don't see that a lot from commanders. Yeah, Alexander loved that. He loved doing that. It, it, made, it made for great propaganda, which is, was always his main thing. I can imagine, like, having your leader, your big honcho, your visionary person right there on the battlefield with you. Yeah, it, it really reinforced his demigod status because he wasn't just fighting with his troops. He was always at the most important part of the battle. He was always right in the thick of the worst fighting and just as in much in just as much danger as the rest of his troops. Um, so if nothing else, you can at least hand that. You, you can hand it to him for that. Uh, he, he does better than most generals in that regard. <laughs> at one point in the fighting... Uh, he received a sword blow to his head. It was he got cleaved in his head so hard that it cut right through his helmet and cut through his scalp down to the bone. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So he's just sitting there on his horse, kind of swaying around, dizzy, half conscious. And as he's just sitting there trying to get his bearings back, because he probably has a concussion at this point, like. Like there's just like a flap of skin hanging down over the side of his head with like his bare skull now showing to the earth. Okay, so that sounds a pretty gnarly wound for even today. How likely did that actually happen? He definitely got a head wound at this battle. Like that's that's not uh that's not really up for debate. How bad it was is up for up for interpretation. Okay. He definitely got a head wound of some sort and it it disabled him pretty badly in the middle of the fighting uh well i mean head wounds also especially in the middle of battle can look way worse than they are yeah yeah because you got so much blood in your head that even a tiny little cup cut is gonna look like you just got stabbed to death um 
So while he's sitting there on his horse, just kind of swaying around, bleeding profusely, half conscious, um, another Persian officer starts riding uh, some sort of Persian cavalryman. In some accounts, it's one of the commanding officers and others. It's just like a random Persian cavalryman. So this Persian cavalryman starts charging towards Alexander, convinced he's about to cut the head off the snake and end the entire battle right then and there. But just before he gets to Alexander, one of Alexander's officers, Clytus the Black, that's his nickname. His name is Clytus. He's nicknamed the Black or Black Clytus, depending on uh, how you translate it. Okay. Uh, Clytus uh, manages to stop this cavalryman and kill him before he reaches Alexander. Uh, remember Clytus the Black. Clytus the Black. He's going to come up later, and it's going to be really sad. <laughs> does he die horribly or something, or does he do some tragic shit? He dies in a, an unimaginably sad way. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. But, yeah, remember his name. So... Alexander, he's now, he's he's passed out at this point. He's fallen off his horse. Uh, but, but now that the cavalry has opened up this gap in the Persian lines, uh, the Macedonian center immediately rushes into the gap and just starts tearing the, the Persian army apart. Just limb by limb, they absolutely annihilate those guys. I mean, can you blame them you've got this borderline deity who's your commander and you just seen him wounded you would be pissed off oh yeah yeah that was a big that was a big part of it uh they were ruthless the only members of the persian army that didn't break and flee from the battle uh were the greek merc mercenaries led by memnon uh they retreated to a small hill and they made like a like a Spartan 300 Thermopylae style last stand. I, I gotta make a sad confession right now, Derek. I've never seen 300. It, you're not missing anything. <laughs> it's it's like Transformers for history buffs. Oh god. Yeah. So these Greek mercenaries retreat to a small hill. They made their last stand. The Macedonian army would actually sustain more casualties dry, trying to dislodge these Greeks than they would in the rest of the battle combined. There are about 6,000 of these Greek mercenaries. By the end, about 2,000 survived and surrendered. Dang. Uh, Memnon got away. Um, the Persians ended up losing about 6,000 total at the Battle of Granicus. 4,000 of those being Greek mercenaries because the mercenaries were the only run ones that didn't run. And Alexander's army, according to his own historians, lost about 50 soldiers. Okay. Most historians agree he probably lost around 120. Any idea why it was agreed upon that number rather than higher or lower? Um... Just based on like how many troops he still had left, like in later uh, later events that happen after this, I'm not entirely sure on how historians determine a lot of these numbers. It's probably a lot of guesswork. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of weird math. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was the Battle of Granicus. Let's take a sip. So among the dead at the Battle of Granicus. Including one included one of Darius's sons, his son-in-law, and his uncle-in-law. That's a lot of Darius's relatives in a single battle. Yeah, uh, uh, the Persians lost over a hundred very high-ranking noblemen. Like half of the Persian government was wiped out at this battle. Was that common? Because uh, I know nowadays that they don't really put people who are family members in the same kind of area if they're in an area where they could get killed um back then it was like in especially in like uh like kingdoms it was really common for a lot of both your military leaders and your political leaders to be directly related to your king so like alexander had a bunch of in-laws that were commanders in his military and 
it was even more common in the Persian Empire because they had a more specific, like delineated, uh, like noble caste. Okay. That were uh, like that were clearly marked for running the government and running the military and things like that. Um, a lot of it had to do with just the nature of politics and those kinds of systems. Uh, in positions of power, you want people that won't try to overthrow you, and you can't really trust anybody more than your immediate family. All right. Um, especially your military, because if there's one thing that can overthrow a king nine times out of ten, it's his own military. And so you you have to keep the military in uh, faithful and loyal hands at all times. Isn't that kind of like a big thing throughout history? Kings going on like horrible war paths and then out of nowhere their armies turn on them because they're like okay i'm done with this shit i know i know it happened a lot in the like the roman empire and yeah that's that's like a that's like an expected thing to happen you have to keep the loyalty of your troops um by paying them and making sure they're well fed and by winning battles and if you fail to do any three of them they're liable to just kill you that's a that's a regular thing for pretty much every army throughout history. From this point forward, Alexander could focus more on shoring up his administration in Asia Minor. Um, he kind of decided to pretty much just keep the Persian system in place. So the way that the Persians did it were uh, different regions were put in under the command of like a noble caste of governor, like political governors called satraps. And the regions that they the regions that they controlled were called satrapies. So it's kind of like a dukedom. Yeah, it's kind of like, kind of like having a king, and then it's 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 almost kind of like a feudal system, except instead of it, it's instead of these titles being based on like land ownership, like you'd see in feudalism, it was just a political appointment. Like these guys were political leaders in so far as they were uh given that authority by the king by the emperor or king above them it wasn't like a a title that you could pass down to your kids it very often worked that way because that was just an easier way to do it but um it could just be revoked at any time it was basically like uh it's kind of like the president of the united states appointing his cabinet he could just kick somebody out if he wanted okay but the these satraps would represent and would speak on behalf of the of the king uh in their immediate region where they were given control um and they would accept taxation and military levies from all of the different people that lived all the different communities that that lived in the satrapy that they controlled so it was their job was kind of half political leader and half bureaucrat, basically. I mean, bureaucracy, bureaucracy is not really a new thing. No, it's not. At least in a basic form. I mean, our current understanding of it is relatively recent, but someone in position of power kind of appeasing others is, yeah, it's, it's not new. Yeah. And back then, uh, the Persians... The Persian bureaucracy was kind of novel um, in comparison to a lot of the Mediterranean. A big part of that was because that region of the world had about a 2,000 year head start on creating bureaucracies ahead of everybody else. Because the first bureaucracies first kind of sh started to show up uh, when the first like governments developed. And like we talked about in the Fertile Crescent, the first like the Assyrians and the Babylonians, all of their the mechanisms of organizing their their governments relied heavily on more primitive versions of bureaucracies, um, and so a lot of those traditions already existed in that region and were just built upon by the Persian emperors. And so, but relative to other people, including the Greeks, the Persians had a very advanced form of bureaucratic organization. So Alexander decided that he didn't really have the time or the resources to try and completely reorganize the bureaucratic system that the Persians had going. So instead, he just kept it in place, uh, pretty much intact, 
but just replaced the satraps with people that were loyal to him, either people from his own government or locals who he thought he could rely on. I mean, it'd probably be easier because if he established a new system, even if it was basically the same, he would have to take time to make sure it was set up right. He'd have to take time to make sure the right people were in place. Instead, he could just pick people. I know they're going to be trustworthy. I can just put them in this position that's already established. Right. Because, and yeah, because completely redoing it from scratch would have taken years, if not decades. And he wanted to be done with this invasion ASAP. Um, he wanted, he wanted the Persian empire conquered as fast as he could. And then on top of that, he knew that there were still like Persian armies hostile hit to him somewhere out there that he'd have to deal with. So he just didn't have the time to completely reorganize this bureaucratic system. Plus, like I mentioned, the Persians just did a really good job and you don't need to break or you don't need to fix something that's not broken. From this point forward, basically, whenever he conquered some new region, he would just keep the existing bureaucracy in place and replace the satraps with his own people. Um, that, that he'd do that pretty much all the way to the other side of Asia. I mean, I can't really blame him. It's, it's the easiest way to assert your power. Yeah, it is. It 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 just makes sense. It's just what you do. <laughs> um, so he and his army continued east um, from the uh, Granicus. Kind of, they they were kind of just wandering all over the place. Whenever they'd come across a city, they'd accept their surrender. Uh, they'd put a little garrison there. They'd put they'd make somebody a local satrap, and then they'd continue on their on their way. That's basically how they're doing it. While they were doing while while things were going pretty well on land, uh, Alexander was concerned about the fact that the Persians uh, navy uh, still controlled the eastern Mediterranean, uh, which posed a really big threat both to his communications and supply lines back to Macedon. I mean, it would have to, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, so. And another thing is that if the Persians decided to just start landing troops in Greece, uh, they could get all of the other Greek states on their on their side immediately to go and fight against Macedon. And there's nothing that Alexander would have been able to do about it. I guess he's lucky that it didn't go that way. It almost did, and we'll get to that. So he knew that he didn't have a navy that could effectively fight the Persian fleet. It was just too good. Um, it was. It wasn't actually per, a Persian fleet. It was by a group of seafaring people called the Phoenicians. Um, have you ever heard that phrase before? It sounds vaguely familiar, but I couldn't tell you for certain what, how or why I know that. Um, have, have you heard of Carthage? Yes. Yeah, like like Hannibal and their war against the Romans. This came a couple hundred years after Alexander. Mm, I couldn't tell you details, but I, I again, it's like something I may have heard about, but don't know like hardly anything about. Yeah, if you have like a basic knowledge, like if you've heard the fr if you've heard anything about Roman history, you'll have heard of like the Punic Wars and the Roman War against Carthage. Carthage was a was Phoenician. Um, so the city of Carthage was originally a Phoenician colony. Um, the, the Phoenicians originated on the Eastern Mediterranean coast in what's now like Lebanon or Western Syria. Okay. So that area just North of like Israel, Palestine. Um, and they were amazing shipbuilders and amazing sailors. And that's why, they were one of the richest and most powerful cultures in the Mediterranean for a while. And at this point, they were their navy was in service to the Persian Empire. Okay. Um, so his plan, Alexander's plan, because he knew he couldn't beat the, the Phoenician navy at sea, he decided to beat them on land. And the way he would do that was that he would march down the eastern Mediterranean coast uh, through Syria and through Judea and get all the way down into Egypt, which was all of that area was controlled by the Persian Empire. And if he could make it to Egypt, he would completely cut off 
the ability for the Persian fleet to dock anywhere. And so either the fleet would starve to death in the middle of the ocean, or they would defect to Alexander so that they could so that they could land or they could make dock in those cities and not starve to death in the middle of the ocean. It's an ingenious move, to be honest. Yeah, and it was really the only option that Alexander had because he he really didn't have a navy that could stand up to the Persian navy. So he's continuing to just wander around Anatolia, subjugating people. He comes across the city of Halicarnassus, which is in southwest Anatolia. And here he runs into Memnon again. Uh, he's going to run into Memnon a lot. Okay, I know you alluded to that Memnon died. Is Alexander involved, or is it just... Uh, say that again? I said you alluded that Amidnon, Memnon dies. Is Alexander involved in that, or does it just so happen that one of his enemies gets taken out? Alexander doesn't really play a role in it. It just happens. We'll, we'll get to it. I find that always fascinated. Like, you know how throughout history that someone will die and it benefits, like, a very powerful figure, but just so happens that they didn't have anything to do with it? Right, yeah. It it's just dumb luck. And you'll find out that Alexander was probably one of the luckiest people to ever live. I mean, it already sounds like it. Yeah, if if he stopped his career right now, he'd already be just one of the luckiest pieces of shit in the, the just human history. So this time Memnon was in control of Halicarnassus or in charge of the garrison there. Halicarnassus was an extremely well-fortified city. Memnon's troops were all extremely well-disciplined Greek hoplites who could easily stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Alexander's phalanx. On top of that, the Macedonians were having a provisioning problem because in this area, they couldn't really forage because it was already it's, this region of Anatolia was already really dry. And they were in the middle of the dry season. So there weren't really like crops around this area for them to forage for and get food. They were making it just barely on their supply lines. But the nearest supply point for them was three days march away. And so it was, yeah, so it, they were in a really... And then on top of that, they were basically like locusts. So whenever they came through a new area, they picked the entire place clean in order to feed their army. So they couldn't go back the way they came from because there was no food that way. So Alexander was put into the position where he'd have to assault this city and take it so that he could continue forward or he would his entire army would start to starve. So his only choice was to dislodge Memnon's troops with a direct assault. The the problem is Memnon was a clever a clever general almost as almost as good as Alexander and he was able to keep Alexander's army at bay with well timed assaults coming out of the gates um, hitting Alexander's troops head on and then while his troops were distracted some other troops would come across come around and just set all of his siege equipment on fire. I mean that's a genius way to do it. Yeah, and then once they did that, they just retreat back behind the walls. During one of these assaults, the biggest and the last assault of the siege, Memnon had snuck a contingent of his troops around another entrance uh, that was on the other side of Alexander's armies, which uh, he hadn't made use of before, and so Alexander hadn't stationed troops in that area. And so they were able to come out and come around behind alexander's lines and so his entire army ended up getting boxed up Dad, dumb. yeah he very nearly lost his entire army right there he was only saved because so part of his part of his contingency of or part of his group of phalanx uh were made up of veteran troops who had served for years under philip and like the last stint of their term was uh, under Ale was under Alexander just at the start of his invasion of Asia. And so there was a whole bunch of just old guy, like middle-aged guys, just grizzled veterans uh, who were just kind of following along as camp followers. They didn't have to fight anymore. Wait, so did, did they have like a system where there was like a retirement back then? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, if you joined the army, you had a term of service. It was like, I think it was like 20 years like a retirement plan or whatever obviously lives are a lot shorter back then wow i didn't think that like 
Yeah. Well, well, it's it, you have to keep in mind it's specific to a professional army. Obviously, obviously. Yeah, for like for the Persian army, their infantry were just random just random people that they picked up when it wasn't farming season that they would go and take on campaign and then they'd bring back and let them keep farming once the planting season came. So they they didn't have like a set retirement or anything. They just kind of got dragged along whenever they were needed. But for a professional army like Alexander's, uh, these soldiers worked 24-7 as soldiers for a, a, spe- a specified term of service. And then once that service was up, they could go back home with a retirement package, basically. Usually that retirement package was like, they'd get like a plot of land and a certain amount of money every year until they died. Wow. So I didn't even think that retirement, I mean, it's basically like ours. I mean, obviously very, it was very prototypical of our retirement system had existed that long. Oh yeah. Yep. It's yeah. I think it's, Wow. I think it's a, a few hundred years older than this at least. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of been a thing like whenever you just have a have soldiers who are like full-time professional soldiers, that kind of comes as part of the deal. It would be a really big thing in the Roman legions later, too. But yeah, so this battle, there were a whole bunch of veterans that had their Serbs of service had just ended and they hadn't quite gotten the opportunity to go back home yet. They saw how the battle was going and they were like, all right, we got to show these youngsters how it's done. And so they got all their armor back on and they came out for one last battle. They fought so ferociously that they caused a mass rout of the entire of Memnon's entire army. The story goes that Memnon's troops uh, that were still stationed on the wall panicked and dropped the gates. Uh, They dropped the gates and ended up locking like half of their army out. Holy crap. Yes, half. So many men ended up bunched up on the moat bridge in front of the gate uh, that it collapsed into the moat. Wow. And then anybody who was still outside of the walls uh, was swarmed by Alexander's troops and cut down to a man. Uh, that night, Memnon and his uh, and the other commanders there kind of realized that, oh, we're not going to get out of this. And so they packed up as many troops and civilians as they could on some transport ships, and they left. And as they were leaving, they set fire to all of their provisions so that Alexander couldn't get his hands on it. But it was a little windy that night, so the fire got out of her control. And so the next morning when Alexander entered the city, he found the city like half burned. Um, So he didn't, his job was done. He didn't really get anything out of it besides the fact that he could now continue on. Um, So he just put a local, like a, a collaborator who is a claimant to the throne installed her as queen of this city and made her the satrap for the region and then continued on his way. He kept on going, kind of doing the same thing. He eventually found himself on the road to the city of Gordium. While he was while he was on his way there about that time, he received reports on what was going on in Greece and it didn't look good because uh, Memnon... The first thing he did after he left Halicarnassus was he teamed up with the Phoenician fleet and he started uh, an expedition against the Greek city-states. So he had already taken several islands in the Aegean Sea and he was starting to get in contact with some, some of the cities in Greece to get their assistance if he decided to invade. But... He, But Alexander, he got word of this, but he couldn't really do anything about it. He just had to trust that his regent, Antipater, would be able to deal with it some way. Why couldn't he do anything? Is it because he was stuck in the other continent? Yeah, his whole army was in Asia Minor. Okay. And he couldn't... He couldn't turn back now or he'd lose everything that he had done so far. Because he knew that as soon as he pulled out, the Persians would move back in. Well, that it just makes sense, yeah. So he decided to put faith in Antipater and just keep going. So he pushed on. He entered the city of Gordium. And it's I guarantee you've probably heard of this story before. So he enters the city of Gordium. And in Gordium, there is a relic which was revered by the inhabitants, which Alexander was really interested in. Um, This relic was an ancient wagon. It was like a hundreds of years old wagon that was tied up to a pole that was standing next to the temple of Zeus in Gordium. What was the wagon supposed to be? Do what? What was the wagon supposed to be? So 
according to stories, this wagon had been used by King Midas. Have you ever heard of King Midas? Yes, Stone Touch. Yeah. So Gordium was the kingdom that King Midas from the legend ruled over. And Gordium had been founded by Midas's father, Gordius. So this wagon was... The reason this was, that this wagon was important was because it was tied to the pole with this intricate and complicated knot. The knot is... A, supposedly, it was a knot that sailors would... Sailors refer to as like a Turk's head. Um, it's like a ball, like a ball of string, and the ends of the knot are tucked into the center so you can't reach them. Okay. And an oracle had once foretold that any person who could unfasten the knot would become the lord of all of Asia. That sounds way too convenient. Yeah. Yeah, it was It was very convenient. Um, so obviously Alexander was interested in it because he wanted to go, it's just a knot, how hard could it be? He'd go, he'd untie the knot, he'd It'd be a big propaganda boost for him, uh, and it, it'd give him some of his self-confidence back, because at this point, he kind of didn't know if he was actually going to win. He didn't know what the future had in, in store for him. Wait, you're saying the most lucky man in possibly history had self-doubt? Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. Even Alexander doubted himself sometimes, even if he wouldn't admit it. That, that's a that's a lesson for all of you people who are struggling in life right now, that even Alexander doubted himself sometimes, even if he was too much of a prick to to admit it. So yeah, I don't know if you've you've noticed yet, but the story I'm talking about right now is the story of the Gordian Knot. I've actually only heard about the Gordian Knot, Satori. I've never actually heard heard the actual story itself yeah so this is the story so he he wanted to go and he wanted to get this loot on this not undone so he arrives in gordium he immediately beelines for the temple of zeus he finds the wagon and he starts going to work on the knot he turns it around in his hands a few times he starts kind of trying to dig through it to find the end and he sits there for by some accounts hours just trying to figure out how to undo this thing because now he'd put himself in a really, really bad situation. Because if he if he couldn't get this knot untied, everybody would know that he was not able to get that knot untied. And according to like the religious sensibilities, the oracle said, if you could get that knot undone, you'd be the Lord of Asia. And if he couldn't get it undone, he would be the Lord of Asia. And so his campaign was doomed. Well, obviously. And that would embolden his enemies. It would demoralize his troops. It was an awful situation for him. And so he started to panic and he started to get angry. As one does. Until finally, it just completely frustrated beyond belief. He throws down this bald knot and he looks out to the crowd that's just been watching him do this for hours. And he just yells out, what difference does it make how I loose it? And he drew his sword and he cut the knot in half. That's cheating. Well, he did it. He did it. Yeah, but that's obviously not how it was intended to be open. Is it? Undoing a knot and cutting the rope, at least to my modern perspective, are completely different attempts at it. Like, you can cut the rope. Hey, I'm just getting rid of this part of rope that's not really useful to me. Versus, I am saving the rope itself. I mean, obviously, the rope has no significance to me at this point but still you have to save the rope if you're undoing a knot you're saving the rope if you're just getting rid of the knot you're cutting it okay but the oracle didn't say that anybody who could loose the rope and use it afterwards would conquer all of asia they only said whoever could loose the rope and that's exactly what he did and poetically which was great for his propaganda he loosed it with a sword which is exactly how he would become the Lord of Asia. That, that, that's how he presented it. I, I still feel like he missed the point. It was a feat of skill. I, it, semantics, I know, but still, it's, it, it doesn't count in my opinions. No, it wouldn't count in any reasonable person's opinion. Also, on top of that, he just went ahead and took a sword to this ancient relic that was really important to this community of people. Could you imagine if, like, I went to, like, a museum and cut something because some prophecy said, oh, the person who fixes this thing shall be the king of whatever. Oh, it was it was worse than that. 
it wasn't like going into a museum. It was like going into the church in Turin, Italy, and just taking a knife to the Shroud of Turin. Oh, God, I didn't even think of it like that. Jesus. Yeah, the relig- it, because it was a religious and cult- it was of religious and cult- cultural significance to these people. So they don't they don't talk about like the effect that like how the people of Gordium responded to him doing this. But I can only imagine like you this this asshole just cut our ancient relic in half. Oh, uh, I I I'm, I'm kind of not surprised that somewhere in history there wasn't a mention of them rebelling because that would not like. Obviously, from a modern perspective, I'm not someone from that ancient context. If someone went and did that to my religious object, I'm not super religious, but if someone went and did that to something that had a big significance to me that, no, you have to do it this way, and someone just cheated, I would be pissed. Yeah, it... (laughs) But again, like the histories don't relate how the Gordians responded to it, but I I can only imagine <laughs> how how ridiculous that would have been. Then, but then again, back then, like they didn't have a they didn't have a sense of like like cultural preservation, uh, like cultural the idea of cultural preservation wasn't really a thing back then. So maybe it was like like oh he just added to the history of the knot. Maybe it was something like that. I still feel like it was cheating, personally. Again, obviously a modernist perspective, but like everyone expected, I guarantee everyone expected it to go and, and un, to actually be untied, not to be just cut. Well, to be fair, though, he did end up becoming the Lord of Asia. So spiritually, maybe it was perfectly in line with the spirit of the prophecy, if you believe in that sort of thing. So... But anyways, so after that, he leaves Gordium, and while he's conquering a kingdom called Paphlagonia, he gets more of that luck. He's conquering this kingdom of Paphlagonia, which is in Central Asia Minor. He gets another report back from Greece, and that problem with Memnon, it just solved itself. Memnon just got dick, just got sick and died. What? It was that lame? It was that lame. He just got sick. He just got some ancient disease that's about as bad as a bad nowadays as the mind, like the common cold. I don't know which disease killed him, but yeah, he just got sick and died. That has to. That's the most anticlimactic way to lose. Is oh, I just got sick. Yeah. Yep. And with that, that was the last hope that the Persians had of like trying to get Greece to rebel against Macedon. Because after that, the Persian fleet was kind of headless. They didn't really have command. And so they just kind of raided. They just, just kind of like became pirates and kind of raided for a little bit. So yeah, now Alexander's position back home was perfectly safe. So he finished subjugating the Paphlagonians. And that pretty much made him the undisputed ruler of Asia Minor. That was like the last, last major stronghold he had to deal with. So from this point, he starts heading south. And he's going to go into that area we talked about, Phoenicia kind of like western Syria and Lebanon, that area, he starts moving that direction. And his intention is to go down the coast, like I said, cut off all of the port cities and force the Persian fleet to surrender, um, and then eventually make it to Egypt and conquer Egypt. While he did this, uh, Darius, or Darius, I still don't know how to pronounce that. I think it's Dar- Darius, but Darius... I feel like Darius, with, with pronunciation that we hear from back then, probably be closer because Darius feels like a more modern interpretation of pronunciation. Yeah, you're probably right. I'll use Dar- I'll use Darius, unless I say Darius out of habit. Whatever. So Darius was still in his capital in Susa, and he was now organizing a new army. He was just because Persian, the Persian Empire's resources were basically limit- limitless. He could just raise a new army if an old one got destroyed. And now he decided that he wasn't going to leave it to his generals anymore. He was going to be commanding the army himself and face Alexander in battle. So in the meantime, Alexander's army took a route through a pass called the Tar, uh, a route through the Taurus Mountains in eastern Anatolia, uh, through a pass called the Cilician Gates. He was really, really nervous. He thought. He thought that if the Persians were stationing a powerful garrison at the Cilician Gates, he would have no way through, and his his campaign would basically stop there. But the Persian command, the commander of the Persian forces in this area, was one of the guys who survived the Battle of Granicus, and he decided 
a little too late that now now he's going to try Memnon's idea and he's instead of instead of confronting Alexander head on he was just going to start burning farmland what yeah <laughs> i mean i know you focused on Alexander's army was a scavenger, but how is he the first one to figure out, hey, let's just burn the farmland. It'll stop him. The thing is, this time he made the wrong choice. Oh, goodness. <laughs> because if he had actually stationed his whole army at the Cilician Gates, he would have stopped Alexander, and Alexander's campaign would have ended right there. Oh, wow. Because he would have been able to hold that pass. It was the only way through. And so, but instead he just left like a couple hundred guys there. And they, when they realized that they weren't going to get reinforced, they just left. Like they didn't even bother. So Alexander's troops arrived. They saw these guys running away and they just passed right through the Cilician gates without any trouble. Holy crap. I mean, seriously, can this has to be like, if I had any argument that there were deities and there has to be a god of luck that was on alexander's side there's no way that kind of coincidence happens without that yeah he actually said after the fact that um the fact that he didn't have any trouble getting through the Cilician gates was the greatest stroke of luck he had in his entire career has to be there's no way without it yeah, the greatest stroke of luck in his whole career. I would argue Memnon just keeling over for no reason was a bigger stroke of luck. They're very close, though. You could argue one or the other. Yeah, easily. <laughs> uh, from there, he made his way south through the Taurus foothills till they reached the river Kidnus. Something to keep in mind about these foothills that he's traveling through. They are boxed in by mountains on three different sides. And so during the summer heat, like he was traveling through, it ascent that entire valley area became essentially the world's largest convection oven because all of that heat was bouncing off the mountains directly down into the valley. So it could get up to like 120 degrees during the summer. Jesus. Yeah, so his entire... So his entire army was like dehydrated and starving and he was dehydrated. They reached the river Kidnus, And the first thing that he does is he sees this river and he goes, he strips off all of his clothes completely naked and he jumps right in. That is ballsy. Okay. There's a problem though. It's about 120 degrees out in the sun. This river was fed by melting snow off of the mountains which means that this water was probably close to between 40 and 50 degrees. <laughs> when he jumped in, he got a cramp so bad that his troops thought he was having a seizure. I mean, I can't imagine jumping into like, we're guessing like 40, 50 degrees, right? Yeah. Jumping into that, especially on a hot day, the shock your body would go through. They obviously didn't know back then, so they had no idea to avoid it. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, um, and that's exactly what happened, is he went into shock. They pulled him out, and his his skin was pale and clammy. He was barely breathing. He was half dead. And so they took him to his tent and put him in bed. And it, as it turns out, sometime during the march, he had developed some sort of bronchial infection. Probably. This is what historians suspect. Because while he was... While they were trying to get him to recover and while he was resting, he developed pneumonia. Obviously. I mean... Obviously. <laughs> there's no way you don't get pneumonia from that. Yeah. It... You shocked your body so freaking hard. That's what, like a 60, 80 degree difference? Yeah. Yeah, he went from yeah he went from 120 degrees to 50 degrees, so that's 70 degree difference, at least. And that's just our estimate. Didn't go into shock hard. That that's a really hard shock. Is shock usually just like twenty to thirty degrees normally? There's no like set set amount. It's just a, a ra any sort of rapid temperature change can send your body into shock. It's just it's just your body responding to uh, sudden changes in environment by prioritizing blood flow to your internal organs at the expense of like your uh, like your limbs, and so it causes your blood pressure to drop a whole bunch. And if it drops too quickly, then it can kill you. He's one lucky bastard. Like, like all right, so that probably should have killed him. 
Yeah, it should have killed him, but um, this is where his upbringing uh, starts to pay dividends. So for one thing, like we like I've mentioned before, he was in amazing physical shape, like Olympic athlete level physical shape. Did, how did he keep up with that? I mean, you probably don't know, but how do you go on a war campaign and keep your physical fitness to an absurd level like that? Um, most a lot of it was because he was doing a lot of the physical labor a lot of physical labor with his troops, both in order to keep in shape and also because it kept his troops morale high to know that their their general was out there like like doing stuff that soldiers do. I mean, I can't if I was in the military and I knew my commanding officer was doing the same level of work I is was, I couldn't imagine. Yeah, and uh, another thing is like this guy's this guy is already like convinced everybody he's a demigod. So like imagine your half god king general just in the mud just kind of working with working to pitch tents with you. <laughs> like it it's it gets to a point where it's almost like absurdly surreal. Like it 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 almost feels wrong. It would have to be. It would have to be. Yeah, but he yeah, he so he starts he gets pneumonia, he starts running a fever. He's like halfway into a coma at this point. But because he was extremely fit and healthy, and also because he had learned so much about medicine from his time with Aristotle, he was actually able, with, with his physician, he, he was able to get some medicine or make himself some medicine that actually helped him recover. Uh, we don't know exactly what that medicine was, but he did something, and it kind of helped him bounce back. That's weird, because obviously, historically, medicine wasn't at the label the way it is now. It's more herbalistic, but... To have been that knowledgeable in so many disciplines to be able to also do medicine, it, it sounds downright preposterous. Yeah. Um, he One of the benefits of being like a rich nobleman is that you get a lot of practical education on a wide variety of topics. And if you're smart enough to know how it all works and to know why you should know it, uh, it can really come in handy. And it comes in handy a lot for a lot of historic rulers in similar situations. Yeah, so he, he starts to bounce back, bounce back from this sickness. Before he even really starts to recover, he are, he goes ahead and puts his army back on the march. I mean, he had to have had a lot of confidence. Like, I'm a demigod. I'm gonna win. Yeah, that that that's basically, the, that's the theme of his entire life, basically. Well, I'm the son of Zeus, I can win. And that eventually, later on, we'll see we'll see it get to a point where it becomes genuinely unhealthy, both to himself and for the millions of people around him. But yeah, he gets his army back in the march. They subjugate a few cities. They deal with some pro-Persian local like guerrilla forces. And while they're doing that, scouts report that uh, Darius's new army has just been spotted in a place called uh, Sochi, just across the mountains in Syria. So Alexander orders his troops to converge at a place called Issus. He decided on Issus because it was the convergence point for all of the major mountain passes through the mountains. He knew that he knew that Darius would eventually have to take one of those passes in order to get to him. And they all converged on this one place. But for some reason, though, he got it into his mind, maybe because of some bad intelligence or maybe because he just misread the situation. He got it in his mind that Darius would definitely go through one of these passes called the Syrian Gate. Okay. And so he made one of the most dis disastrous mistakes of his entire career. And he moved his army to another an, another place called Miriandrus, um, which was just at the opening of the Syrian gates and left a small garrison of his troops at Issus to defend all of his sick and wounded. Because and he thought that Issus was completely safe. He didn't have a thought in the world that they would try to come through one of those passes closer to Issus. Okay. He was convinced that Darius was going to go through the Syrian gates. So guess what Darius did? He went through Issus. Yep, he went straight for Issus. He got his army through the pass. He swept away the Macedonian force without any effort at all. And, oh, this, mm, this is going to suck. Um, he took all of these sick and injured soldiers, and he cut all of their hands off. Why their hands? Is there any significance? Um, this, uh, 
this is like a callback to the Persian invasions of Greece. Uh, cutting off hands was what uh, Xerxes did to uh, Greek Greek spies that he found in his army. And so Dar- Dar- Darius knew that Alexander would get this reference. Um, and it was kind of like, I'm. so what he did was he cut off all of these soldiers' hands and he dipped their stubs in boiling pitch in order to cauterize it. And then he marched all of these troops in front of the entire Persian army, which outnumbered Alexander's probably between two and three to one. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then once, once, once they saw the full scale of the Persian army, uh, Darius sent them back to Alexander to tell him what they had seen. So an invitation tactic. So he was like, we're so big, there's nothing you can even possibly do. So you might as well surrender. Is that what he's trying to do? You think? Yeah, they, he's he's trying to disconcert the king. He's he's kind of mocking him, trying to throw him off of his edge. Um, because Darius knew he was in a really good situation right now. Because he had captured Issus, he was now behind Alexander, and he stood smack in the middle of Alexander's uh, supply line and communications line. Alexander would have, he wouldn't be able to go, he wouldn't be able to go east because that's where Darius was. So he had no way back into Asia Minor and he couldn't go south or, or he couldn't go west back into Asia Minor and he couldn't go east or south because there was nothing there but hostile land and he would be cut off from the supply lines. So he had absolutely no choice but to go and attack uh, Darius. Obviously. He's goading him into it basically, wasn't he? Yeah, he's kind of he's kind of cocky now. He's like, I've got you exactly where I want you, and I'm going to let you know exactly what it is that I'm going to do to you. On November 5th, 333 BC, Alexander moved his army back to Issus and faced the Persian army across the Panaris River. While he while he marched, he kind of just leisurely leisurely and carefully formed up his troops into battle lines, and they kind of just carefully walked forward. They weren't they weren't in a hurry to get anywhere. Um, he's he's kind of Part of it was he was kind of waiting to see what Darius did, and he was kind of he didn't want to exhaust his troops before they got to the battle. I mean, it makes sense. You don't want to show up like I can barely move because that, that that's not going to get you a successful result, even if you're confident in your troops. Yeah, Alexander knew that he had to have absolutely every benefit on his side in order to beat this. No less because he knew what kind of battlefield he was about to walk into. So to his left was the coastline. So it was just open ocean to his immediate left. He had Parmenio command the left flank with phalanxes and the Thessalian cavalry. On his right were a series of light hills and like mountainous outcroppings. And so as he moved forward, he kind of saw the Persian cavalry. So the, the Persians were set up on like a hill right behind the river. So Alexander would have to cross over the river. And it, it was a pretty small river. It was like a large stream. So it wasn't impossible. It was only like waist deep. Okay. But he'd have to, his army would have to cross it in order to attack, uh, which was not a great situation. I can't imagine it being any kind of good situation, considering this guy has Alexander exactly how he wants him, basically. Yeah. So the first move of the battle was that Darius had archers set up on the left flank at Alexander's right flank where he was commanding. And the Persian archers let out one single volley. And they only let out one volley because that's all they had time to let out. Because as soon as they launched that volley, Alexander sent his companion cavalry across the river and crashing into the archers. They immediately broke without a fight. They immediately abandoned the field. And within less than a minute of the battle starting, uh, Alexander had destroyed the Persian left flank. Holy crap! How is that even possible? Well, Darius probably knew that something like that was going to happen. He probably didn't know it was going to happen that fast because Persian archers are were really, really... They were some of the best archers in the world at the time. And so he thought that he'd have more time to let out more volleys. He didn't anticipate Alexander being able to get his cavalry across the river that fast as that was happening the rest of the the army was getting stuck in with the persians the phalanxes were having trouble getting across the river because the river banks were extremely steep and 
each side of the rivers were covered in a bunch of weeds and brambles that they kept getting tangled up in. And so as they climbed out of the river, they were immediately confronted with, especially in the center of the line, they were confronted with more Greek mercenaries who, like I've mentioned before, were themselves extremely well-trained and veteran. Uh, and so they were able to easily stand toe-to-toe with Alexander's phalanx. And for the moment, neither side was able to make any progress. But because Alexander had gotten the Persian left out of the way so quickly, he was now able to redirect his cavalry and do exactly what they had tried to do to him at the Granicus, and he went directly for Darius. I mean, I don't blame him. Like, this is the guy causing me all kinds of problems. I'm going to get him. Also, at the same time, he had the tables turned on him. Because he had advanced so quickly, a gap opened up in his line. And so a bunch of Greek mercenaries immediately flooded into the gap in his line. And it kind of turned into a reverse situation of the Granicus. About 120 Macedonian officers were killed, uh, plus dozens, hundreds of Macedonian soldiers. Meanwhile, Alexander, while that was happening, he didn't have time to think about that. He had to turn his cavalry and go and fight Darius directly. Because if he cut, like at the Granicus with himself, if he cut the head off the snake, he could cut down the Persian Empire in one fell swoop. So he he and his cavalry charge into Darius's bodyguard. During the fighting, he ends up stabbed in the thigh, but it's not a bad wound. Like, it's just something he, he had to get stitched up afterwards. He ended up coming out in better shape than he was at the Granicus, that's for sure. I mean, obviously. And after a little bit of fighting, Darius realized that he was in really serious trouble because his bodyguards weren't able to keep up with the companions. And so he hopped on a on a chariot and he fled. And so Alexander, he wanted he was about to order his tr- his cavalry to go and chase Darius, but then he got messengers reporting that both his center and his left flanks were very close to breaking because of that gap in his line his center had been outflanked and were starting to get killed off and so he realized that he'd have to either choose between losing his army or losing his chance to kill darius and he knew he couldn't go on without his army and so he swung back around he crashed into the rear of the greek mercenaries they ended up fleeing and then the per the cavalry on the persian right wing they saw that the the Greek mercenaries were fleeing, and they fled right behind them. And before long, the entire Persian army was running away. I mean, can you blame them? <laughs> Keep in mind where this battlefield is. This is a valley completely surrounded by mountains. Wow. So, the only place that the Persians had to flee to were through the mountain passes. At, at this battle, the Persians were holding most of their infantry in reserve, like at the Granicus. A lot of ca- Persian a lot of Persians were, a lot of the Persian infantry were trampled to death by their own cavalry who were reti- retreating. All of these Persian soldiers started to run away, and they all tried to pack into these narrow mountain passes where they got bunched up, and it became like a human crush. So a lot of a lot of these Persian sol- soldiers ended up getting crushed to death while they were trying to escape. And then because they were all bunched up, Alexander's archers could just fire freely into them. They didn't even have to aim. They just had to point their arrows in the general direction and they'd end up killing somebody. It was it was a bloodbath. But Alexander wasn't focused on the Persian army. He was focused on Darius. By the time he got the Persian army to broke, Darius had a half mile head start on him. And so he he chased after he chased after Darius, but he couldn't reach him because all of these Persians were clogging up all of the mountain passes and kept him from going after Darius. And so Darius ended up getting away and living another day. So he missed out on Darius, but despite that, Alexander had still won one of the most impressive victories in his entire career. There a lot of historians say this was probably the most important victory of his entire career. That's crazy. Uh, the Battle of Issus. Also, drink. Hmm. Might want to take a second sip when I tell you this body count. How bad was the body count? Jesus, I don't even want to think about it. 500 Macedonians, which is, you know, a little bit higher than he's been used to for a while. And 20,000 Persians. 20,000 people in an afternoon. This was like, this battle lasted just like two and a half or three hours. 20,000. That's ridiculous. Jesus Christ. That's, that's hard to pull off without him, like, really 
extremely modern stuff and to think they did it back then and it got removed yeah it's amazing how many people you can kill when those people aren't fighting back because most of those casualties happened after they had retreated when they got bunched up in those mountain passes so now Darius was on the run, his authority was undermined, and the entire Persian Empire was now opened for Alexander. Alexander was 23 years old. He's only tw- he's our age and he's pulling the shit off? Yep, he was a year younger than I am right now when he won the Battle of Issus. So what are your thoughts so far? Alexander was one lucky SOB. There's no way any of that happens. Even if you account a lot of it to, like, embellishment from historical events, that this happens without some kind of, like, deity figure on his side. It, it's crazy. Yeah, it, and that's something that comes up time and time again when you're reading biographies about Alexander. It's just how lucky he was at every turn. He had a natural skill, and he had a an insanely effective war machine behind him, but he never could have done everything that he ended up doing without a tremendous amount of luck. The amount of luck that Alexander had is ridiculous. Like, not even just like, oh, that's kind of suspect. There's no way that happened. There's like the amount of absolutely, my God. Yeah, uh, Memnon's death the Cilician Gates, bouncing back from his pneumonia, that so many opportunities where he could have been stopped dead in his tracks. So many just tiny little things that had to go wrong, which for all it, for really should have gone wrong, but ended up not going wrong. And because they all went right for him in exactly the right way, history was changed forever. It is It, it boggles my mind how much of the modern world only exists because of dumb luck. You're not kidding. I'm literally just sitting here stunned because I, I, yeah. And that's, that's one I wanted to establish first um, because from this point forward, uh, he's just going to skyrocket from this point forward. He's going to reach new heights of power and authority that really had not ever been seen before in human history. Um, and so, something to keep in mind going forward is just how much, in, in it, like I said, in addition to his skill and to the act, like the actual political, ge- like geopolitical situation, the political situation back home, all of this stuff that allowed him to be able to do what he did, and then just throw all of the dumb luck in there, and you have the perfect storm for a a single man from a small backwater country in northern Greece to conquer all of the all of the Middle East. I'm still sitting here baffled about the amount of luck Alexander had to have had. Like So yeah, that's that's all I got for today. Any more thoughts? Out of all the arguments I've had for uh, there being a higher power, I don't think anything's more convincing than the amount of luck Alexander had. Because there's no I can't perceive any possible reality where there's no some kind of higher figure guiding Alexander's path because that sounds downright impossible. Yeah, and guess what? He would leverage that to the best of his ability. Look how many opportunities I had to fail, but I was guided through by the power of the gods because I have their favor because I am one of them, more or less how he presented it. That's all I have for this episode anything you want to say before we head out i think i can say with confidence alexander the great was literally the luckiest sob in history yeah 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 that can that can be argued everything went his way for so long that he convinced himself that he was divine i mean and he even grew up in it didn't he you said that it was claimed that his mom supposed he was from Zeus's heritage, and then even more that maybe Zeus had slept with his mom. Yeah, and in the next couple episodes, we're going to get a lot more into how that idea develops into some uh, 
some really bad stuff. <laughs> some some really bad stuff. So yeah, this has been the Alexander Society, and we'll see you next week. Or I guess what next week, next couple weeks. Next time. Let's just go with next time. Yeah, next time. And uh where we're gonna talk more about Alexander when he enters into Egypt and then moves eastward to finally conquer the Persian heartland. Have a great day, y'all. This has been the Exalic Alexander Society. Derek, where can they find you on social media? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one, the O is a zero. And they can find me at Tim, a.k.a. Otis, on Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Alexander Society podcast. If you enjoyed listening to our podcast, please give us a rate and review on your podcasting service of choice. Have a great day. Thank you.